In these last few sessions, we've talked about how best to estimate discount rates, cash flows, and growth. In this session, I want to focus on a fundamental point that we all have to remember when we do valuation. All good things come to an end. What are those good things? If you have a high growth company, it can't keep growing at those rates forever. If you have a company with great products, those products might not stay great forever. In this session, I want to talk about closure in valuation, how we bring things together at the end. And you have two choices. At some point in time in your valuation, you can assume that your business will end and that you will liquidate it, sell it for what it can get on for the different assets. The other is you can assume that the business will continue beyond that point in time. It's called a going concern or a terminal value. That number creates more mischief in valuations than any other input. In this session, I hope to put some rules in place that will keep that number from running away from you. So we've talked about cash flows, we've talked about discount rates, we've talked about growth rates. We have one final piece in this puzzle that we've got to get in place for valuation to work. We have to put some closure on this process. What I mean by that is you can't estimate cash flows forever, right? The value of an asset is the present value of its expected cash flows over time. But what if you have an asset that potentially could last forever, as is the case with a publicly traded company? Since you cannot estimate cash flows forever, at some point in time you've got to stop. But you can't give up on cash flows either. And what most people do is estimate what's called a terminal value. So that's the role a terminal value plays. It's that number that you're using as a bookend to capture what will happen beyond year 5 or 10 or whichever year you put the terminal value in. So what I'd like to do actually is talk a little bit about the approaches used to estimate terminal value. And broadly speaking, there are three approaches that are used to estimate terminal value. In my view, one of these three approaches should never be used, but it's actually the predominant approach that ends up being used. Here's the first one. At the end of year 5, year 10, year 15, you can shut the business down and sell off its assets. That's called liquidation value. When I value private businesses, that is pretty much how I estimate terminal value almost all of the time. Because when the owner ends a business, that's pretty much what happens to business. It gets sold off in pieces. The second alternative is to assume a going concern value, which is to assume your company will keep going after year 5 or 10, but that its cash flows will grow at a constant rate forever. You think, what will that do for me? If your cash flows grow at a constant rate forever, you have what's called a growing perpetuity. Again, you might wonder, so what? If you have a growing perpetuity, you have an infinite series. Now, this is becoming a mystery. An infinite series in mathematics, we know the answer to. We can actually solve the value of an infinite series. That's pretty much what happens when you have a growing perpetuity. You can write an equation that captures the present value of all cash flows beyond that point in time if you're willing to assume that your cash flows will grow at a constant rate forever. That's a going concern value. Liquidation value and going concern value are both legitimate ways to get a terminal value. So I've given away the game. Here's the one way you should never use to get a terminal value. You shouldn't apply a multiple to year 5 or year 10 numbers, an EBITDA multiple or, or a revenue multiple or an earnings multiple. What's wrong with it? If you do that, you're really not doing intrinsic valuation. You're doing relative valuation. You're using a multiple. Your multiple is way out in the future, but it's still a multiple. People who use relative valuation to get the terminal value and claim to have done a discounted cash flow valuation are really presenting a relative valuation in what I call drag. Those cash flows in years 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are distracting. They're distracting because they're distracting you from the key number used in the valuation, which is the 8 times EBITDA used to get a terminal value. So the next time you see a discounted cash flow valuation, check out the terminal value. If it comes from a multiple, call it what it is. It's a forward relative valuation. So your choices are liquidation value or going concern value. So the standard approach to estimating terminal value is that going concern approach, where you assume your cash flows grow at a constant rate forever. That's a very convenient way to estimate terminal value, but it can also get you into trouble. In fact, when you look at valuations, the number that usually gets valuations in trouble is the terminal value number. So I'm going to introduce four very simple rules to keep your terminal value in check, to keep it from running away with your valuation. First check. Make sure that you don't exceed the cap. What am I talking about? Remember in a going concern, terminal, value, terminal valuation, you assume your cash flows will grow at a constant rate forever. 
That growth rate, we said, cannot exceed the growth rate of the economy. But that leaves you with an estimation problem. You don't know what that growth rate is going to be. So here's a proxy you can use for the growth rate in the economy and as a cap on your terminal growth rate. Use the risk-free rate. Think about what goes into risk-free rate. There's expected inflation and an expected real interest rate. Think about what goes into the growth rate of the economy, expected inflation and an expected real growth rate. I think the risk-free rate is an excellent proxy for the nominal growth rate in the economy. But even if you don't think it's a good proxy, I still think it makes sense to use it as your cap on your growth rate. And here's why. If you think the risk-free rate is too low, your cost of capital is too low, right? To compensate then, I'm going to force you to keep your growth rate low. It keeps your valuations in sync. So use the risk-free rate as the cap on your growth rate. That's the first rule. Here's the second one. You have to make a judgment about when your company will become a stable growth company. My advice, don't wait too long. I've seen discounted cash flow valuations where people wait 20, 25, 30 years to put their company to stable growth. That's extraordinarily long. And here's why. If you look across the history of, US, of the US market and you look at growth companies, about 99% of growth companies have growth periods less than 10 years. In fact, the median growth period for a high growth company is about three to five years. I never use more than 10 years as, as a growth period in my discounted cash flow valuation. And if you're looking across companies trying to decide which company should grow for longer and which shouldn't grow for five, maybe six, eight, 10 years, here are some of the things you should look at. One is look at the size of your company relative to the market that it serves. If you have a large company in a mature market, Toyota, for example, don't get carried away. Where's the growth going to come from? Use a shorter growth period. If you have a small company in a huge market, Whole Foods and groceries, for instance, you have much more leeway. You can allow for a longer growth period. Second, look at recent growth, not in earnings, but in revenues. Revenue growth rates give away the game before earnings growth rates catch on. So if your revenue growth rate last year was only 5%, be wary about using long growth periods and high revenue growth rates. And third, remember it's not growth that creates value, it's growth with excess returns. The stronger and more sustainable the competitive advantages your company has, the longer its growth period can be. So do some strategic analysis of your company. Third step in the process, think about excess returns. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the return on capital you think your company will earn in perpetuity. Remember, that return on capital is going to come under downward pressure from competition. So one of the issues you have to examine in terminal value is what kind of return on capital you're going to give your company, and it's a big decision. And here's the number you should compare it to. You should compare it to your cost of capital and stable growth. If you assume, as some analysts do, that in steady state, stable growth, you cannot maintain competitive advantages, then the logical assumption is the return on capital should go to the cost of capital. The excess return should go to zero. If that is the case, it doesn't matter what your growth rate is. Your terminal value will be the same whether you use 0% growth, 1% growth, or 2% growth forever. If you set your return on capital above your cost of capital, and you might do that for some companies with really long-term competitive advantages, then your growth rate will still matter, but not as much as it would have if you hadn't brought the return on capital down. My rule of thumb with return on capital and stable growth is for 80% of companies, I go to the default. The default is, as I said, it equal to the cost of capital. For one in five companies, where I think that the competitive advantages are large and significant, I will leave the return on capital above the cost of capital by maybe two or 3%. That gives these companies an advantage and a higher value. Last piece. When you make your company a stable growth company, give it the characteristics of a stable growth company. In other words, if you have a bait of two and a high cost of capital during your high growth phase, that's okay. But when your company becomes a stable growth company, I would expect to see the beta move towards one, maybe see it use more debt in its, in its capital and a lower cost of capital. Your company cannot change in terms of growth with everything else remaining intact. So in summary, when you look at your terminal value, make sure your growth rate is capped. Make sure you're putting your company into growth at a reasonable point in time. Make sure you're thinking about excess returns in perpetuity and make sure that you're giving the company the characteristics of a stable growth company. If you do that, your terminal value will stay within your control.